Yo, what up? Josh Room from East West Healing and Performance. Just gone into the office. It's a little cold today in my office. I got the heat going. It's the holiday season. We're off next week. Really excited about it. We're starting our program, The Metabolic Blueprint, on January 5th. Don't forget to visit our website at eastwesthealing.com. The link's right at the beginning of the show and down in the subject of the YouTube. You can visit the Metabolic Blueprint link. That's also in the subject uh, the description of the YouTube. You can read up. You can sign up right there via PayPal. Don't forget to join us for this eight-week, nine-lesson teleseminar that's full of great information if you love our philosophy and want to learn more. So check it out. Today I want to talk about Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Now I'm going to share a lot of your, a lot of the facts that I've been reading and researching, um, and I'll add a little bit more to it, of course. So I got a lot of notes here that I want to share with you. We have to think about this. There's so many people being diagnosed with Hashimoto's. Now a lot of the time. Um, you typically see with Hashimoto's, doctors will do just a lab, and a lot of the times they're just testing TPO or other antibodies, and they'll say if, you t if your TPO levels are high, that you actually have Hashimoto's, and a lot of the times I feel, and of course I'm opinionated, that a lot of the times if they don't know what's going on, their last ditch guess is Hashimoto's. Well, if you study the work of Dr. Ray Pete and Broda Barnes, they say the only way you can actually know if someone has, has Hashimoto's is to actually biopsy the gland. Because when you, when you have Hashimoto's, you get an infiltration in the gland by lymphocytes causing destruction of the gland. And the only way you can see if there's actually infiltration and destruction is through biopsy. Now, I'm not a research expert on that or testing expert. I'm just bringing and shedding some light to it so you can think about this if you're walking around with a diagnosis around your neck and thinking you have Hashimoto's and there's nothing you can do about it. So hopefully I shed some light on it today. Typically, we see with Hashimoto's, we'll see constipation, dry hair, loss of hair, thinning of the nails, white spots on the nails, fatigue, uh, heavy or regular cycles, of course, premenstrual issues, weight gain some of the time. You see a shrunken, a shrunken thymus and a shrunken thyroid. A lot of the times on a full lab, you'll see free T4 is actually low. You'll see serum TSH actually high. Now, high for us is anything actually, you know, a lot of people say, you know, between this and this, or one to two is actually normal. The lower for us, the better, because TSH, the closer to zero, better. TSH is just as inflammatory as serotonin, as histamine, as prolactin, as estrogen, etc. So we want to get it as low as possible in the body. You'll typically see low or actually normal T3 levels. So of course, there's actually a conversion issue going on in the liver. That's where you convert over 90% of the hormones of the thyroid, and 10% 10, 10 of them get converted in the thyroid, and I'll talk about that. And a lot of the times, you'll see anti, um, anti-thyroid peroxidase antibodies actually elevated, and anti-thyroglobulin thy antibodies are actually elevated. Now, those are your basic kind of signs and symptoms. Let's go over some of the facts and go back to inflammation. Inflammation in the body is a process when the production of debris in the body gets too large or too fast for the body to actually eliminate them. The metabolic shift in the body at the cell level basically shifts towards lactic acid production, the mobilization of free fatty acids and proteins for energy, instead of the actual, sorry about that, production of carbon dioxide of the cell, the optimal utilization of oxygen, thyroid hormone, etc., cholesterol, to produce carbon dioxide which is very pro-thyroid and very anti-inflammatory. Anytime the, shifts toward cell, the cells shift toward lactic acid production, that's a huge burden on the body, it's a huge burden on the liver, the muscles, the gut, etc. And the problem with this is anytime we're, we're inflamed, the body releases excess parathyroid hormone. And in a nutshell, your cells actually hold on to calcium, and you lose sodium mag and magnesium. This is why a lot of people, when they're have a, a damaged metabolism, actually have issues with muscle relaxation, they lose sodium, they have blood volume issues, they'll get high or low blood pressure, morning sickness, eclampsia, swelling, edema, etc., or increased toxicity in the body. Now, anytime our cells hold on calcium, estrogen also gets pushed in, the, pushed in the cell. Those two things alone are very excitatory to the cell anywhere in the body, but they also alkalize the cell, and they don't let sodium get in. You lose sodium and magnesium in the urine. And this is common in people who are hypothyroid. Another issue is the calcium actually perpetuates the production of lactic acid because it causes the cells to convert glycogen into lactic acid instead of into carbon dioxide. So this is highly inflammatory. And I've done videos on calcium, and you can actually take a look at them. You can look at the link above and check out the video on calcium. I did it a couple weeks ago. But you need optimal vitamin D production and storage and utilization. You absorb most of it in the stomach, calcium. 
So it could come down to actually not maybe taking in enough, or it could be lack of absorption in the body. Now the thing we have to think about is this, and I've been thinking about it, is inflammation actually the body's normal response to a pathogen, or, or a pathogenic process, or is it actually a pathogenic process in itself? If we think about it, diabetes, AIDS, cancer, all these things stem from inflammation, osteoporosis. So is inflammation actually a pathogenic process? Or is it our body's innate response to a pathogenic process? It's kind of something I've been tossing around and thinking about. Because proper control of the immune system comes down to basically maintaining the proper balance between tissue growth and tissue atrophy. And anything, aging, stress, anything that is in the presence of estrogen actually perpetuates the growth process. But we could say atrophy as well because it shrinks the thyroid and thymus. Um, the growth process towards abnormal cell growth. Now, if we think about it, estrogen, radiation, heavy metals, dioxins, fluoride, PUFAs, they all damage the thymus. They shrink the thymus. They actually decrease the thymus's um, metabolic rate because the thymus is very sensitive. It's actually regulated by sugar metabolism. And it's very sensitive to anything that actually limits its energy. And those things actually limits thymus energy. And I've talked about this before. Everyone says the thymus shrinks as we age. What if from blood sugar dysregulation, inflammation, the birth control pill, heavy metals, fluoride, who knows? All these things, stress in itself, actually shrinks the thymus. Now, the thymus is important because during puberty and pregnancy, the thymus actually increases in size, or it should increase in size. So, I think anytime the thymus actually shrinks, those things will actually inhibit thyroid conversion. You actually push yourself towards the autoimmunity process. Now, if we look at PUFAs going down the PUFA rate, you know, I talked about estrogen, it shrinks the thymus, etc., inhibits the thyroid, overburns the liver. It can actually stimulate cortisol independent of the hypothalamus and pituitary and actually perpetuate the stress reaction, causes edema in the body and in the cells. PUFAs can actually, it's, it's interesting because PUFAs are unsaturated fats from beans, lentils, above ground vegetables, fish oils, things like that. They actually interfere with the formation, I'm going to read this to you, um, of thyroid hormones in the thyroid. Now, 10% of this happens in the thyroid. So it prevents the cross-reaction of idotyrosine to idothyronine residues that create thyroglobulin. This is important for the thyroid. So what happens is the result is abnormal or antigenic thyroglobulin. And that will actually show altered levels, TPO levels in the body, or high TPO levels in your lab. Now, estrogen actually does the same, same thing. So they can actually decrease cellular respiration, push you towards inflammation and lactic acid production. They decrease thyroid hormone activity in the body and progesterone activity in the body. And thyroid and progesterone are actually antagonistic to all those substances I talked about. They can actually activate the aromatase enzyme and estrogen in the body, which perpetuates certain diseases like PCOS and inflammation and edema and eclampsia and high blood pressure. And they can actually activate the production of tissue antigens by toxic products of lipid peroxidation. Basically, not oxidizing glucose or using, using glucose for your primary source of energy, but trying to use fats for your primary source of energy, breaking down tissues which is highly inflammatory to the body. Now, we could say aging is actually estrogenic because the, through the aromatase enzyme and through eating PUFAs, we produce more estrogen as we age in our fat cells. And the more weight we gain, the more we produce. And this actually perpetuates the inflammatory cycle and so forth. It perpetuates the inability of the conversion of T4 to T3 in the liver. It actually shrinks the thymus and pushes you towards immunity. Now, the interesting thing about estrogen in this whole process is this. I'm going to go to my little notes here and kind of get to that part that I want to talk about. Normally in the thyroid, you have a colloid production. It's a protein. It's called thyroglobulin. And this gets produced by certain cells. We can actually produce T4 to T3, 10% of in the thyroid. Well, it's been shown, right, with Hashimoto's, typically people are hypothyroid with the increased thyroid growth, or it gets bigger. Now, it's been shown that estrogen actually stimulates colloid production, which is the production of this protein, which is actually, we should say, in a, in a nutshell, good because we want to produce more thyroid hormone. The problem with this is it actually inhibits the breakdown excuse me, the breakdown of this. So it inhibits the colloid cell production, so they grow by these cells, but it actually inhibits the very proteolytic digestive enzymes that are produced by the cell to actually break it down. 
So like I said before, anything in the presence of estrogen increases growth or abnormal cell division. So you get an increased growth of the thyroid with a decreased breaking down of the colloid cells. And progesterone is actually antagonistic to this process because it not only, now I'm not saying say take progesterone, I'm talking about through regulating metabolism, through eating the right foods, and in the end, if you need it, you can take it the right kind and the right dose. But progesterone actually stimulates colloid production, but it actually stimulates the digestive cells to release proteolytic enzymes to break it down to get normal production of thyroglobulin. So estrogen and all these other you know, toxins that I talked about, PUFAs, unsaturated fat, etc., stimulate the growth and actually promote the antigenic, um, you know, I talked about they interfere with T4 to T3 conversion, so you get this antigenic thyroglobulin substance produced. And it's also been shown that thyro antithyroglobulin and antithyroid proteins, like I talked about, are very similar in molecular structure to connective tissue proteins. Now that's based off the, the work of Ray Pete. Now that's pretty interesting because when we break down tissue and we break down proteins and fats when we're inflamed, that's connective tissue. So what if the elevated antithyroglobulin antibodies in the body is a sign of being estrogen dominant or progesterone deficient or thyroid deficient? It's a sign of having increased toxins in the body like fluoride, heavy metals, etc., dioxins. And it's a sign that we're actually in the body increasing tissue breakdown because we're not utilizing substances at the cell level and we're actually in an inflamed state. Now, I think that's pretty interesting because so many people are actually walking around hypothyroid increased, you know, size of the thyroid gland and they're being diagnosed with Hashimoto's thyroiditis. And we have to think about this because we could say, is it really the thyroid gland? Now, of course, it is the thyroid gland, it is the liver, but there's so many things that we need to look at. Is it the diet? Is it the wrong foods that we're eating? Is it foods that are high in unsaturated fats that are perpetuating this process? Is it foods that have estrogen-like capabilities, or is it not eating the right foods, the right frequencies, and the right ratios for our body that's causing the stress reaction, that's increasing estrogen levels, because anything that goes towards stress stimulates estrogen to lower blood sugar levels, which is increasing inflammation, increasing the thighs, size of the thyroid, and actually inhibit thyroid conversion in the liver and overburdening the liver. Is it a selenium deficiency in the liver? Is it a glucose insufficient in the liver? Is it a gut dysfunction that's actually causing a calcium deficiency, which is perpetuating the stress cycle and basically making our cells convert glycogen into lactic acid, etc.? So I know this was a little bit technical, a little bit all over the place, but the bottom line is when you have Hashimoto's, you need to think about where is it coming from? Is it unsaturated fats? Is it estrogen? Is it fluoride? Is it heavy metals? Is it dioxin? Is it all these things that actually inhibit thyroid conversion, progesterone production, upregulate estrogen production, cause our cells to hold on to calcium, which is excitatory, creates more inflammation, and at the same time shrinks the thymus that actually pushes you into this autoimmune state with an increased size of the thyroid. So hopefully you've enjoyed this clip. Hopefully I've helped some people that have Hashimoto's, stirred the pot a little bit so you can think a little bit more about what's going on and what you need to change in your life. Wishing everyone a happy holiday and new year, and I'm out of here.